Um, we are in our series, Made for Greatness, After God's Heart, and uh, hopefully this has been an encouraging and even challenging series for you. I know it has been for me and, and the rest of our preaching team as we've been preparing it, just realizing what God's Word says about all of these things. I know in my small group, we've been having just really, really awesome discussions as we've been processing the messages together, and I hope that you have as well. And uh, you know, we are continuing this series today, and we've been looking at the journey of a guy in the Bible by the name of David, because... Scripture tells us that the word is given to us by God to help point us to Jesus, first of all, but secondarily to how we are to walk with him in faith and how we are to live this life of faith on earth. And so when we look at stories of the lives of guys like Joseph in our previous series and now David, there are a lot of lessons that we can learn from their interactions with God and their walks of faith as well. Both the good stuff that they did we can learn from, but also the bad, as we'll see in a couple of weeks. But uh, we started off looking at the story of David and how God saw his heart, promoted him, anointed him to become king, and how he had to face off with the lion, the bear, and eventually Goliath. And we saw how it was the faithfulness in the little things that prepared David to face the greatest challenges of his life. And we pick up the story here in 1 Samuel chapter 18, because this is, to me, one of the greatest defining moments in this David story. Because right after this moment, he, takes, he ascends to the throne. But there was another test that came his way that really shaped him. And I think there's a lot of lessons that we can learn from this. In 1 Samuel chapter 18, right after defeating Goliath, David is hailed as the hero of Israel. He basically saved the whole nation from being enslaved by the Philistines. And we pick it up here in 1 Samuel 18, starting in verse 6. It says, when the men returned home, were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul, who was the current king, with singing and with dancing, with joyful songs and with timbrels and lyres. As they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. Saul was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. The next day, an evil spirit from God came forcefully on Saul. He was prophesying in his house while David was playing the lyre as he usually did. Saul had a spear in his, in his hand, and he hurled it, saying to himself, I'll pin David to the wall. But David eluded him twice. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with David, but had departed from Saul. Let's pray as we begin the word this morning. Father, we thank you for your word that reveals your heart to us and reveals how we are to walk with you in faith. And so, Lord, I pray this morning as we study your word that your spirit would illuminate what you want to illuminate, shine your light where you want to, to help us to walk with you, to be the men and women you've called us to be. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple of things from this passage that I think uh, stand out before we dive in too much is notice that it says that in verse 10, an evil spirit from the Lord came forcibly upon Saul. What, what, what was going on here? David was hailed as the hero. Da Saul now, the current king, is getting jealous of David. And in his jealousy and in his wickedness, because before Saul had already been you know, rejecting God and doing all kinds of funky stuff, what often happens is when we turn our backs on God and we want to do things our own way and we allow our hearts to get cold and dark and even bitter and angry, God, opens, God turns us over to the enemy for judgment. And when this evil spirit came in, it was because God had said, all right, if you don't want to follow my ways and you don't want to do things my way, fine, you ha be, have at it, right? Do, do, do it your way. And it says that an evil spirit came in and came upon Saul. He became demonized or demon possessed, however you want to put it. But what was going on here? See, when we resist God and we say, man, I'm going to live my way. I don't want to do things God's way. God backs off. He's fine. If you don't want to do things my way, then I will back off. And what happens is the enemy comes in and can take over. And that's what was going on here. Saul had, had rebelled against God so many times and now was getting jealous of David because of his success and God took his hands off and in comes this demonic spirit that ends up messing with him and making situations so much worse. And then he picks up a spear and he throws it at David trying to kill him. How many of you have ever had spears thrown at you? Hopefully not literally, uh, but metaphorically. People get jealous, people get angry, people get bitter and they throw things at you. They hurl words at you, they hurl insults at you or they hurl accusations or, or even just circumstances come up as people are jealous and angry and bitter. And oftentimes it can be stuff that we, we didn't do anything to deserve that. And yet the spears come flying our way. Anybody ever been in that situation? Anybody, okay, want to be honest in church? The last service they were super honest, amen. Um, they're a little older so they've experienced a lot of spears being thrown their way. And so... 
David did nothing but be faithful to God all this way, and all of a sudden now the jealousy of the king gets hurled at him. He tried to kill him twice. David eluded him. First point here in your notes and on screen, seasons of mistreatment and injustice will happen to us all. How we respond is what matters. The sad thing and the sad reality is we live in a fallen world with a bunch of other sinners just like us. And in this fallen world, seasons of mistreatment and injustice will come to every single one of us, whether we like it or not. And I think we all realize that that's just a reality. People don't always treat us fairly. People don't always treat us rightly. People are sometimes selfish and they get bitter and they get jealous. How we respond when spears are thrown at us, metaphorically speaking, is what matters to God. God watches how we respond when spears are thrown at us. And as we'll see, David responded with faith and with taking the highest of roads, and God honored him, and God blessed him, and God justified him in the end. But how we respond when spears are thrown at us really matters. How we respond when our coworkers maybe mistreat us or accuse us of things, or when our boss promotes someone above us, amen? Or how we respond when the referee doesn't give the call your way on your kid's sports team. That's my greatest challenge right now, I tell you. I just, <laughs> I gotta bite my tongue. Sometimes I just don't look, I don't wanna see, I don't wanna know, All right? How we respond when things aren't fair, God sees that. God sees how we act, how we respond, what we post on social media as a result, oh, hallelujah, right? Because our culture is quick to retaliate. Have you noticed? We live in a time where now cancel culture is the thing. If people don't like what you said, don't like what you did, they're going to look to cancel you. They're throwing spears all the time, right? Do we retaliate by icing others out or doing something or scheming to get back at them, to keep them down because of what they did to you in the past? Or we could retaliate and try to get people fired for what they did or what they didn't do, make people feel excluded or mistreated. Now we cancel people, we dox people, we look for ways to ruin people's lives and livelihoods. That's what our culture does. But that's not the culture that God wants his people to have. Can I hear an amen to that? There's a different way that God wants his people to live and act and in response to the mistreatment of others that will either point to him and shine a light of the gospel or will throw a blanket or a cloud over the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can't be like the rest of the world that retaliates. We can't be like the rest of the world that gets back evil for evil, eye for eye. God says there's a higher way. I was watching a, a TV show recently or a program, and I realized, man, if everyone just like forgave, the show would be over. <laughs> you know what I mean? Have you ever noticed like every, almost every movie, every TV series, it goes on and on and on, eight, series, eight seasons, 10 seasons, because people just don't forgive. You know, I was like, man, if you guys just forgave, wow, this thing would be over. Unforgiveness makes for great television, but not for a blessed life. It may make for a great series that we watch on Netflix or HBO, but it's not going to make for a blessed life before God. And as we'll see in how David responded to Saul's unjust mistreatment is what was the, the pivot or the turning point or the inflection point for um, the, becoming a great king, which he was. I was watching this show and I just, it was just screaming in my head, man, y'all need Jesus. Y'all just need Jesus right now. Y'all just need to forgive and this would be all over. And I think from heaven, sometimes God is screaming at us, y'all just need to forgive right now. You just need to forgive. You just need to let that go. You just need to not pick up the spear and throw it back. You just need to walk away. You just need to not type that thing. You just need to delete that post, you know, and watch what God does in response. So how did David respond? Let's look at that. Because Saul didn't just throw a spear at him once. He threw it at him twice. And then he hunted him down and, and tried to take his life. So much so that David had to flee with his, with his men and his soldiers. He ran away. For eight years, he lived on the run as Saul hunted him down. But how did David respond in, that, in the midst of that mistreatment? We're going to learn some lessons from it. We pick it up in 1 Samuel chapter 24, starting in verse 3 to 13. And we're going to see how David responded. Because whether you're being mistreated right now, we probably will at some point in the future. And we need to respond in a way like David did, which brings God's favor. Verse 3, he came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there. And Saul, the king, went in to relieve himself. Now, I just think the Bible is hilarious. Saul goes into the cave to probably make number two because he was in there for a while, okay? <laughs> Had a lot of, you know, lamb that day. I don't know, but he was in there for a long time. Some of you just got that. So much so that David and his men had an opportunity to creep up on him, okay? David and his men, it says, were in the far back in the cave when Saul came in to go number two. The men said, this day, this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. 
Then David crept up unnoticed and cut a corner off Saul's robe. Now get the picture. David and his men are in the back of the cave hiding. And in comes Saul all by himself to go number two. And David's men are like, look, God's delivering him into your hands. Let's go. Let's kill him. Let's take him out. This is, this is God's blessing. Get back at him. Get, get, get vengeance. End this persecution once and for all. Then you can go home and we can go home and our lives can go on. So David crawls up. I mean, that's kind of gross, by the way. I mean, you know, he, yeah, you, just, you know, you just got to imagine. You got to play these stories out in your hand. David crawls up while Saul's squatting down, and he cuts off a corner of Saul's robe. Verse 5, watch this, though. Afterward, David was conscience-stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. Wait a second. He's evil. He was rejected as king by the prophet and God. He, he was doing wrong things, and he, was, he tried to kill you, but yet you're guilt, you feel guilty for cutting the corner of his robe? This is David's heart, right? Verse 7. With these words, David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went his way. Then David went out of the cave and called out to Saul, My lord, the king. When Saul looked behind him, David bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. Notice the humility on David. He said to Saul, why do you listen when men say David is bent on harming you? This day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not lay my hand on my Lord because he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, look at this piece of, of your robe in my hand. I cut off a corner of your robe, but I did not kill you. I could have. See? That there is nothing in my hand to indicate that I am guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you're hunting me down to take my life. May the Lord judge between you and me. And may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me, but my hand will not touch you. As the old saying goes, from evildoers come evil deeds, so my hand will not touch you. Now how many of you, if your enemy had been caught, would you have taken the shot? How many of us, if you had an opportunity to get back and an opportunity to clap back and get revenge and get justice, how many of us, let's just be honest, I probably would have done it. You know what I mean? I'd probably been like, all right, brother. <laughs> you entered the wrong cave, homie. You know what I'm saying? Like, should have pooped over there, but you're in here. You're in my house now. You know what I mean? Like, I, I can't say that I would have done any better than David did. I probably would have done it. I probably would have said, all right, God must be blessing me by having you come into my cave. I guess it's done, right? And that's what our culture does. We take every opportunity to get back at people, every opportunity to one-up one another, every opportunity to get vengeance. But David didn't do that. David didn't do that, not just once, but twice. Because on another occasion, David and his men had another opportunity to, call, to kill Saul as he slept. I mean, but brother didn't pick good places to sleep or go to the bathroom, I guess, but David was right there. And they crawled up and they could have killed him in his sleep. Look at what, what happens here in 1 Samuel chapter 26. Don't destroy him. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? As surely as the Lord lives, he said, the Lord himself will strike him, or his time will come and he will die, or he will go into battle and perish. But watch verse 11, what he says. But the Lord forbid that I should lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. Now get the spear and the water jug that are near his head and let's go. So David took the spear and the water jug near Saul's head and they left. And again, we won't read it for the sake of time. David calls out, look, I could have killed you again. And instead, I just took your spear and your water jug. Stop this. Enough with this already. Stop persecuting me. I could have killed you twice, and I didn't. But yet, Saul doesn't get the message, and he continues to pursue David. Here's the point that I want us to see here. David could have got vengeance. He could have got back. He could have got retribution and retaliation on his own. But he understood something. He said, it's the Lord that avenges. It's the Lord that brings justice. And I'm not going to lay my hand on you. I'm going to let God deal with you. Now, there's a massive, massive biblical principle there that we need to see. When we're mistreated, next point up on screen, we must respond in a way that honors the Lord because it is he, it is God who brings justice. When we are mistreated, we must respond in a way that honors the Lord because it is he that brings justice. Again, look at what he said. This was his, his, his conviction, his heart. As surely as the Lord lives, the Lord himself will strike him. Or his time will come and he will die. Or he will go into battle and perish. But the Lord forbid that I should lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. David understood. Look, I can't lash out on you. I need to let God deal with you. I'm not going to be the one to get vengeance here. I'm going to let God deal with you. And in our lives, when we're mistreated, we got to make sure we take the highest of roads. In other words, we need to look to God as the source of justice and the source of vengeance. If he's going to let him deal the way that he's going to deal, 
but not be the ones who exact justice and vengeance ourselves. Because often what happens is in, in the attempt to do that, we now step outside of the boundaries of God's word to do that, right? We now step outside and we go kill the guy like David could have done. Or we say things that we shouldn't say and we position ourselves in a way that doesn't honor the Lord. And here's what happens. God's going, now, shoot, now I gotta deal with you. I wanted to deal with your enemy, but now I have to deal with you and your evil and wicked heart. See, God is, is, wants to always shape and deal with our hearts first. The Bible tells us that judgment always starts with the church. He always wants to deal with his people first. And if we're now stepping outside of boundaries and stepping outside of God's word to go and you know, get whatever we feel is right out of other people, now God has to deal with the evil inside of our hearts. Because remember, he wants to promote us to places of greatness so that we can have influence. But if we're gonna use the power that we have to get vengeance on others, to control others, to push others down who we feel maybe have mist mistreated us, then we're not gonna use the power and the blessing well. We're gonna use it potentially for the wrong things. And so God first watches to see how do we handle these situations where we feel like we're being treated unfairly, where we feel like we're forgotten. Do we handle it in a way that honors him? Because if we do, like David did, God is the one that promotes, amen? God is the one that can open doors. He is the one that can break walls down for us. But he first wants to see what's going on in our heart. Remember back, way back in week one, what did, what did God say? Man looks at the outward appearance, but I see the heart. I see the heart. Even though everyone would say, you're justified in killing Saul, David. You're justified. That's what all his boys were telling him. Go get him. The Lord's delivered him into your hand. Go kill him. Even though people will think that you're justified, God says, no, that's not the right thing to do. That's not the right thing to do. And I see the heart, God says. And he wants to see how are we going to handle these situations. Can we be a man or a woman that he can trust and promote? Now, someone might say, okay, I get that David didn't want to lash out on, this, on Saul because he was the king. But this joker I'm dealing with ain't no king. Can I go get him, right? Can I get vengeance on this guy? He ain't no king, right? There's a deeper principle here that David understood. And the Apostle Paul writes about this in the book of Romans. He says, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. Another translation says, vengeance is mine. In other words, God is the one who brings vengeance and justice. On the contrary, if your enemy is, now this is, this is hard. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. Not poison, okay, feed him, right? <laughs> if he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will keep burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with what? With good. See, when we get vengeance, oftentimes we allow ourselves to be overcome with evil. We think about the evil that we want to do to get back at a person. And we let those thoughts go in. And what ends up happening is we open ourselves up to the enemy to come in and influence us, just like what happened with Saul. We need to choose to take the highest road, which is to look to God as the source of our justice, as the source of our protection, and not step outside and step into realms of evil to get back at people. See, I think God would say, if you don't forgive, then I'm going to have to deal with you. If you're constantly trying to get back at people and posting stuff on, on social media to get back at people, either passive aggressively or ag aggressive aggressively, then I'm going to have to deal with you because that doesn't represent Jesus. It doesn't represent Jesus when we're flaming people or we're yelling at people and all that. It doesn't do that well. So God goes, I got to deal with you first before I can promote you and bless you. Yes, you're made for greatness, but I can't put you in that position until I deal with your heart first. Can't deal with them until I deal first with you. I remember when I was in high school and I, I came, got saved. A lot of my friends, you know, they kind of turned on me because I became a Christian and all that and um, stopped, you know, wanting to hang out and all that. And I got so bitter. They would say stuff that wasn't true and different things. And I remember just hearing stories like this going, I just got to take the high road. I just got to take the high road. I'm just not going to retaliate. I'm not going to say anything dumb. I'm just going to live my life as faithfully to God as I can. And one of the most encouraging things that, that happened many years later was one of my friends who was never a Christian. He said, you know what? I respect you because you didn't give in to the pressure and the persecution of other people. He said us because he was part of it. You know, you didn't give in to all that. And I respect you for that. That was one of the most encouraging things that I've ever, ever heard because in, in, in our hearts, when, when people tease us or make fun of us or whatever, we want to retaliate, right? We want to show that they're wrong or whatever it is. And you know, sometimes the best thing we can do is just bite our lip, turn the other way and just keep our eyes on Jesus. Keep focus on God. That's what David did. He could have got his vengeance. He said, no, I'm gonna keep my own. God will deal with you. God will deal with you. But I don't want him to also have to deal with me. And many times God is dealing with us because of our bitterness and our anger and our stuff that we do in response. Don't let the Lord have to deal with you, amen? Let's keep our eye on Jesus. Take the highest road. And that's what David did. Now, I love this passage because it says, do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. 
is mine to avenge, I will repay, he said. On the contrary, give your enemy food. God, I hate that. Anybody else hate that? I hate that the Bible says stuff like this because it's hard to do. It's really hard to do. But he says, no, no, bless your enemy. Do good to your enemy. Give him food. Give him drink. And in doing so, what does it say? You will heap burning coals on his head. Now, when I first read that, I was like, okay, I like that. I would love to throw hot coals on my enemy. That sounds really good. But when you understand what that meant in the culture, it meant to bless them. Because it's like this, during the cold you know, nights out in the wilderness, you know, if your fire went out in your house, you'd have to go ask your neighbor for a hot coal to relight your fire. So if I went to my neighbor's house and said, hey, my fire went out, and if I'm the enemy, right, all right, I'll give you one little baby coal. There you go, good luck with that, buddy, right? I'm like, right, you go back up and go, please. But here's what, here's, what, here's what he's saying. Don't just give him one coal, heap coals on him. So much so that he's gonna have to carry it in a basket on his head. That's how they carry stuff, right? Fill that basket up with burning coal so he goes home with more than enough. So that he goes home feeling blessed by you. Even though you wronged him or her, send them home feeling blessed by you. Because as they're walking home with that basket full of hot coals, the guilt and the shame of what they did may sear deep down into the conscience. It has a double meaning, right? Heap the burning coals on their head, bless them. But maybe that heat will give them a, a sense of guilt and conviction, and they'll be conscience-stricken to the point, why would my enemy do this? Why would they bless me after what I did? Why would they give me more than enough after the way that I treated them or what I said about them or posted about them on social media, tried to get them fired? Why would they bless me? And it opens the door for the gospel and the light of the gospel to be shown. See, what many of us do is, you know, we just go, okay, fine. Oh, oh you need help here. One little baby call. Good luck, brother. And they walk home, suck. You know what I mean? And they're all upset. Nothing changes, but when you bless them, when you bless a person, it, something goes down. Why would you do that? Why would you bless me? And it opens the door and it shines the light of the gospel into that person's heart that maybe they may come to repentance. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying here. Give them something to eat. Give them something to drink. Heap the burning coals on them that maybe the heat of that conviction will come down and change their heart. Now, I know this is hard because we're all probably thinking right now of people that have wronged us and you're like, I ain't heaping nothing on them. I'm going to heap something else. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I don't want to bless that person. I don't want to do good to that person. And I get that. I know it's hard. But if we can do this in faith, like David did and many others, what can happen in that person's heart? Hearts can be changed. Lives can be changed. Destinies can be changed, as we'll see in just a little bit. So David understood this. Rather than retaliating, and he, by the way, he, he called out to Saul after, hey, I could have killed you, brother. Come on, stop this nonsense. He offered, him, he offered him repentance. He offered him an opportunity at reconciliation at every turn, right? He was doing good to Saul. What situation are you in right now? Where maybe you're tempted to retaliate, you're tempted to get them back, or maybe you've been scheming away. Maybe the Holy Spirit is saying, don't do that. Scheme a way to bless them. Scheme a way to be a light to them, rather than trying to get back at them. And again, I know this is hard. I know this is hard, but this is the word of God. When we trust in the Lord to bring justice, we don't retaliate, but instead do good, even to those who mistreat us. See, that's the hard part. It's so hard. So hard. See, when we, we need to forgive ultimately because the Lord first forgave us. We need to forgive ultimately because the Lord first forgave us. Look at what Colossians says. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with one another and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive, and here's the key, as the Lord forgave you. Just as the Lord forgave you and me of our sins, we need to forgive others of their sins and offenses against us. And over all these virtues, put on love, which, bind, which binds them all together in perfect unity. At the end of the day, the reason why we need to do this is because God first forgave us. The same way that we depend on the mercy and grace of God to overlook our sins is what we need to do to other people. The same way we depend that when we knock on heaven's door one day, we depend on the grace and mercy of God in Jesus Christ to forgive us of our sins and to let us in. It's with that same free grace that we need to offer to others that have wronged us. Now, I know this is hard. It seems unfair, but it was unfair for Jesus to have to suffer for our sake. Amen? It was unfair for an innocent man to suffer for the sins of, of sinners like you and me. And in the same way that, that we were forgiven, the Lord says we need to forgive others. And so... What motivates our forgiveness and our doing good to others that mistreat us is we got to keep our eyes on Jesus. Again, we don't just take the high road. We take the highest road, which means we're keeping our eyes on the Lord who came to forgive sinners like you 
and like me. If any of you has a grievance against, against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Remember, it was Jesus who, when he hung on the cross, forgave the people that were murdering him. He said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And he forgave those that were murdering him. If he can do that, and he offers that forgiveness to us, we can choose to forgive those who've wronged us. One of my favorite stories about this is a story about a man by the name of Jacob de Chaser. Maybe some of you have, uh, remember the story, you heard about him, but Jacob de Chaser um, was a pilot in, as part of the infamous Doolittle Raid on Tokyo. In response to the bombings of Pearl Harbor, you know, the United States uh, launched a bombing raid on Tokyo uh, called the Doolittle Raid, and, and Jacob de Chaser was part of that. His plane went down uh, as part of that raid, and he was taken as a prisoner of war uh, by the Japanese and was held in Beijing. He was mistreated, he was tortured, he was starved for many years. Three of his crewmates were executed and another died of slow starvation at the hands of the Japanese. You know, they were brutal uh, during that time of the war. As a result, the Shazer had deep hatred towards his Japanese captors. I mean, who could blame him? Who would blame him for having such deep animosity and hatred? I mean, first we got bombed, he retaliated, and then now he's a POW and dealing with all of this injustice as a result. Providentially, the Shazer received the Bible while he was in that prisoner of war camp. And as he read it, his faith grew in Jesus Christ and he gave his life to Christ while there in the, in the POW camp. And he made a commitment to say, man, I'm gonna stand for Jesus even while a prisoner in this camp. And this is what he said. He said, God gave me grace to confess my sins to him. He forgave me of all my sins and saved me. Suddenly I discovered that God has given me new spiritual eyes and that when I looked at the enemy officers and the guards who had starved and beaten my companions and me so cruelly, I found my bitter hatred for them changed into loving pity. The gospel changed his heart. And rather than being angry at his captors, he began to have grace for them. And as he said, pity for them. He began to preach the gospel there in the prison. He began to pray for the sick and even began to, to pray for his captors so much so that even their hearts changed towards him. Many of his captors, it is said, even gave their, gave their lives to Christ because of the Shazer's witness. Well, when the war was over, the Shazer was allowed to go back home. He felt a strong call to go back to Japan. He entered into seminary, uh, got trained, and he went back to Japan many years later, this time not to drop bombs, but to preach the gospel. He dropped gospel bombs instead. And he began to preach the gospel all around Japan and many even former prison guards gave their lives to Jesus. Because why would this man, after we mistreated him so badly, come back to love us? His good, his love towards them changed their hearts. If that wasn't amazing enough, another man gave his life to the Lord during the Shazer's ministry. His name was Mitsuo Fuchida. If you recognize that name, he is the man that led the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Fuchida gave his life to the Lord through the Shazer's ministry. And the two of them became friends. And the two of them began preaching all across Japan the gospel of reconciliation and forgiveness. Two once mortal enemies on opposite sides of this war, now together as friends, ministering the gospel of forgiveness, reconciliation, and mercy. Where does this come from? It comes first from Jacob de Shazer allowing the gospel to change his heart, allowing compassion of Christ to come in and then choosing now I'm going to not just not retaliate I'm going to do good to my enemies I'm going to do good to those who once harmed me and murdered my friends and hurt me so badly it is said that tens of thousands of people gave their lives to Christ I would there I mean it could, the number could be up to hundreds of thousands we just don't know but families destinies lives were changed as a result churches were planted in the wake of the Shazer's ministry but where did it start? It started with him having the heart of Christ within him. See, this world would be such a different place if everyone said, I'm gonna choose to forgive and do good to my enemies like Jacob de Shazer did and allow the gospel to come in and bring transformation. What about in your life, in my life? Is there a situation right now where maybe you feel like, man, I'm being mistreated? How can we choose to forgive and love even those enemies around us? If you're not going through a situation right now, I hate to say it, but at some point, you and I probably will because mistreatment and seasons of that will come to all of our lives, how we respond in that moment will either allow the light of the gospel to shine or it'll throw a blanket over the light of the gospel. Because what confounded the Japanese people the most was why would this enemy, this person who we tortured and mistreated come back to love us, why? And it opened the light of the gospel to shine so brightly through him. What about through you and me? If we love our enemies, 
we do good to those even who mistreat us, maybe they don't change right away, but the light of the gospel sure will shine. Maybe people on the side will say, man, why are you doing that? Why, you should hate that person. Man, you should lash out at that person like David's men. You should kill him. God's giving you the opportunity to do it. You say, no, I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna let God do what he's gonna do. I'm gonna take the highest road and keep my eyes on Jesus. Now, how many know that that's just gonna like, you can see the smoke coming out of people's ears. Why would you do that? It doesn't make any sense. Why would you choose to forgive and love your enemies? Why would you do that? Because God forgave me. Because God loved me. And maybe that will cause the gospel to take root in that person's heart. But here's what I know. If we keep doing what the rest of the world does and get retaliation and get justice and get vengeance for ourselves, the world's gonna keep on spiraling the way that it's spiraling. Someone's gotta put a stop to that, amen? Someone's gotta put a stop to the hatred and the animosity and the anger and the bitterness. And Jesus would say, that's my people, that's you guys. We have to do that. We are the carriers of the gospel of love and forgiveness. How we handle seasons of mistreatment and persecution, God watches and he says, that's a man, that's a woman that I can trust. That's a man, that's a woman that I can promote because they're gonna let the light of the gospel shine everywhere and in every moment. Maybe you're here this morning and you're going through a difficult situation. You're saying, man, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can do that. I know it's hard. It's not a natural thing to forgive our enemies. It's a supernatural thing. It's not a natural ability to love those and do good to those who persecuted us. We're gonna need God's help, amen? I know I do. I can't do this on my own. I wanna retaliate. I need the Lord's help, and I suspect we all do. But if we do, what an impact we can have in our culture, amen? Will you bow your heads with me as we come to a close? Father, we thank you. God, together as your children, we, we recognize and we say, Lord, we need your help. We can't do this on our own. We can't love our enemies on our own. We can't choose to forgive on our own. We're gonna need your help. So Holy Spirit, we invite you to come right now. Fill us with your love and compassion. Fill us with the love of Jesus who came to save sinners, who gave his life to save sinners like us. Holy Spirit, help us to choose to love those that are persecuting us today and in the future so that they can see your love through us. Give us your strength when it's hard. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.